A lot of people don't realize that one third of the cowboys were black, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, and this museum is here to tell the real story about the forgotten cowboys. One of the purposes of the museum is to tell the real truth about the forgotten cowboys. A lot of people got their history from Hollywood. And Hollywood did not show blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asians in a positive manner in the movies. So I played cowboys and Indians as a kid and I was just blown away to find out at the prime age of 45 that black cowboys were there. So we're here and we show uh, uh, pictures, we have saddles, we have a Hall of Fame. So when you come here, you're gonna be scratching your head and said, wow, I didn't know that. And if I don't get at least 10 wows out of you, I have not done my job. Our museum, when we founded it, was the National Cowboys of Color Museum and Hall of Fame. So what we did is we changed the name to identify that it's a multicultural museum, that we highlight the importance of blacks, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, and other cowboys. Did you know that the Buffalo Soldiers protected the Asians as they were building the railroad across the West? right here in Fort Worth where the West begins. So this is an important museum to correct the history of what was really the truth about the diversity of the West. I'm standing in the Bill Pickett exhibit room. Bill Pickett, one of the most noted cowboys who was African American. Uh, as you walk through the halls of the museum, you have a room dedicated to the Native American. Native Americans were cowboys too, the light horsemen. So when you come here the, on the wall, you'll see the 10 great Native American chiefs, Sitting Bull, Quanah Parker. Also, we have an exhibit with the Tuskegee Airmen because they were so important to the development of this country when they fought in World War II. And then as you move down the hall, you see the Buffalo Soldier Room. And that's, a, that's our big star there, because when we started the museum, we will let you learn about the history of the Buffalo Soldiers. Did you know how they got their name? They got their name because uh, the Native Americans of the color of their skin, the wooliness of their hair, and the fierceness in their fighting. So the Native Americans called them the Buffalo Soldiers. And then down at the end of the hall, you see the Hall of Fame room where we have over 120 inductees into the Hall of Fame that we tell the present, the past, and the future of the development of the West, where you'll see, you know, Bill Pickett, see Quanah Parker, you'll see Stagecoach Mary Fields, a black woman that carried the mail in Montana. They have a holiday for Stagecoach Mary Fields. And you go on Jamie Foxx and others, and then on down the hallway, you get into the exhibit room where we have a full-blown exhibit on the vaqueros and tells you the development of how the uh, Hispanic cowboys came about. And a Bass Reeves exhibit. Bass Reeves was a black United States deputy marshal that rounded up bad guys for 30 years. 6'2", sidekick, Native American, and he was a sharpshooter. He could shoot with both hands. And he always got his man. Who are we talking about? Maybe the Long Ranger. So it goes back and it says, Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asians were not showed in a positive manner in Hollywood. So today we have the opening of the Rise Above program that's dedicated to the Tuskegee Airmen and what they did to represent the, the military and protect our uh, bombers in World War II. 
During World War II, uh, the uh, call for uh, escort for bombers was great because of the, the amount of planes that the Army Air Corps was losing, almost 10 planes uh, a day due to uh, the escorts. The white aviators would uh, be baited by the German Luftwaffe. They had a technique where they would uh, bait the fighter escort, they were white, and they would take off and they would chase them and they left the, the bombers uh, unprotected. Part of the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen was initiated by General Davis. General Davis told the airmen, if you left those bombers, don't come back to this base because you, you're going to get court-martialed. So they were under strict orders to escort those bombers regardless of being baited and make sure that those bombers got from point A to point B. And one of the things that he emphasized was discipline. And they were experts at it because of the amount of time they had to train. The reason this whole thing came about is because uh, Eleanor Roosevelt went to Tuskegee, Alabama, and uh, she had requests for, for, for more flyers, and she felt that there was a whole multitude of people that could be good for the war effort, and they were the black flyers. Uh, they started training them in a J3 Cub, which was about 65 horsepower. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt took a ride with the instructor there, and the pictures went uh, into the newsreels all around the nation. And people were amazed that she stepped up and did that. And she pressured her husband, Franklin D., to, uh, to start a, a black flying program. Uh, they were hesitant to do that, but most people thought that it would be a good idea because they knew they would fail. And because of that, they went ahead and said, yeah, we'll do that. There was a lull because the, the Army Air Corps initially didn't know what to do with them, uh, where to deploy them, because they couldn't integrate them in any in of the theaters. So they, they finally got opportunities after months and months of them being at Tuskegee. And during that time they were at Tuskegee, they trained. They trained, they trained, they trained daily. So when they got their opportunity to do a mission, uh, they wanted to make the most of it. So they, they did an outstanding job in doing that. They became the most famous pilots and highest scoring pilots in World War II. They were trained initially by some of the civilian pilots, part of the CAP program. That's where Mr. Platt came in. Claude R. Platt, who, who was our namesake for our, our instructor, who was from Fort Worth. And he was a civilian then, but he was considered part of the Tuskegee Airmen because he was part of the Tuskegee Airmen experience. Rise Above is a call sign that the Tuskegee Airmen wanted to succeed despite all the barriers that they were facing the barriers of having to fight for the right to fight for their country, the barriers of not having adequate facilities to, to be in. The Army uh, regulation indicated that all the officers could attend this one club, but the base commander, uh, he, he was a racist and he saw it otherwise. There was one incident that one of the airmen bumped up against the base commander and he had him arrested for assault. So those are some of the things that were going on at that time that they had to rise above that to be able to succeed and be aviators. Well, rise above uh, can, can stand for a great many things. Uh, particularly today in this country, we're going through so many things and uh, so many people are just losing hope. But to stand up and regardless of whatever adversity you go through, whatever things you have to suffer, that you can stand. And I like the fact that this film shows that they could have complained about their conditions and situations but they chose to rise above, and because of that, there are so many of us today, black, white, uh, Asian, Hispanic, uh, we can all look to this example and say, you know, we can be something. Their career in the Army Air Corps was short-lived because they all received an administrative discharge. Because of that, they, uh, they could not uh, pursue a military career. All of them got out. Now, uh, moving forward, President Clinton pardoned 
all those airmen and had that disciplinary letter removed from their records. The DFW chapter had a, the privilege of escorting those airmen to uh, President Obama uh, inauguration. And they, he had them treated like VIPs because he had indicated this is something that they were heroes to him and he stood on their shoulders. The exhibit at the Multicultural Museum, it tells a story and it gives you a timeline of uh, what the airmen went through during their training. And also there's a very good picture of them uh, receiving the Congressional Gold Medal from President uh, Bush. It kind of puts you in context of what it was like back then when they ended up being in that uniform. There's a big picture of Mr. McDaniels in his flight suit, just as proud and, and steady as he, he is. And some of the pictures are signed uh, by the airmen themselves and some of those paintings that they, they had opportunity to, to be a part of. So one of the unique things I think that the kids would take away from seeing the museum is the, the airplanes, the P-51, that gives them an idea of what a P-51 looks like. You will also see painted pictures of the airmen in front of their planes and in front of the P-51s. The military is a big part of the advancement of American history. So those women who were a part of that would fit into what we're talking about. When the WASP were started up, uh, they were started up by Nancy Love and Jackie Cochran. They were able to convince uh, the Army Air Corps, there was no Air Force at that time, that if you brought women into the picture and had them do the jobs that the men were doing stateside, the men could go overseas and fight. Uh, women weren't allowed to go into combat like they do now, but these women trained. They trained pilots and relieved uh, the instructor pilots here that could go overseas. They trained them in uh, ground control, air traffic control, classroom uh, flight, uh, active flying. That relieved at least 1,200 men to go fight. Uh, and these ladies did all that. They stepped up and uh, provided that service to their country. And they served really as civil servants. At that time, they were not allowed to join the military, so they were not considered military. Therefore, they had no benefits. They had to pay their own way to get to the training. And I thought that uh, training was very interesting to me because I'm a native Texan. The base was in Sweetwater, Texas, where they went to do the training. Those women are very much heroes and role models. And I think that we can associate what's going on today within our society, where there are people who are being still yet disparaged but that hope that they keep alive within them helps them to overcome. The WASP also uh, provided training uh, for another group of people that uh, is history has left behind and they're called the Aztec Eagles. Uh, the Aztec Eagles came from Mexico. Mexico uh, had a couple of their tankers sunk uh, by the Axis powers and they decided to step up to the plate and maybe help uh, in the war effort. Uh, they brought up a group of, uh, of gentlemen uh, to the United States and they were trained by the WASPs. They were trained to fly, gunnery practice, ground strafing. The Mexican pilots did all of that and later on they were sent out to the South Pacific in P-47s. And uh, I never heard about that until I got down here to Texas and some of the people let me know that this is another group of people that participated in the war that nobody knows about. The passion is educating our kids about the diversity of the West. And every time I get to do that, I get inspired. I had 29 special needs kids in here about three weeks ago, and we just chopped it up, and they really enjoyed being here. Um, I just enjoy talking to people about the history of the West. If we do keep education at a, as a forefront, if we do keep organizations such as this museum and other organizations across the country, keep them going, telling those stories, those little known stories about people who have not been highlighted or focused upon, that's so important. Mm -hmm.